Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the Pritzker Military Museum and Library. My name is Adam Foreman. I'm the Associate Director of Education here at the Pritzker. I want to welcome you. Today, we're going to be talking about uh, female nurses in World War II. So today, we have joining with us uh, Jessica Wazak, who is from the First Division Museum here in um, the suburbs of Chicago. And we're going to be discussing uh, the female units, the female nurses that were in World War II in North Africa and in uh, Italy specifically. So uh, Jessica, welcome, and I will uh, give you the floor. Thank you so much. I am super excited to be here. I appreciate all of you uh, hanging out today. Uh, the Business of Living is the title of an article that I wrote. Um, and it's following the nurses of the 48th Surgical 128th Evacuation Hospital. Kind of a mouthful. Uh, so I really appreci appreciate being here, um, particularly on uh, in this month and just a little after International Women's Day. Uh, this is the 80th anniversary year of when Americans first set foot across the Atlantic uh, to fight Germans during war or the um, Axis powers. Uh, during World War II. Um, some Americans were asked to go when they were drafted and others volunteered. Uh, one group in particular who volunteered to go to work, uh, go to war, went without traditional weapons. Uh, the women of the Army Nurse Corps are these people that I'm talking about in particular. They were registered nurses and given a couple months of training on how to be in the military. Then they were sent to hospitals all across the front lines and the battered countries around the world. So for me, telling the nurse's story serves to really enrich all of the histories that we know honors their sacrifice and commitment to the Army and the Army Nurse Corps. In 1940, female applicants to the Army Nurse Corps, uh, quote, must be a citizen of the United States between the age of 22 and 30, a high school graduate, a graduate of a nursing school of approved standards, registered nurse, and a member of the American Nurses Association. So women who joined the um, ANC, as we call it, the Army Nurse Corps, were given an officer title uh, as lieutenant, and some of the privileges of male army officers. Uh, although they didn't have equal rank despite the title, uh, they were given military ranks to ensure that soldiers in their care obeyed their instructions. For the women who ended up going to the Mediterranean and European theaters of war, many started their careers in army hospitals uh, very similar to their civilian hospital counterparts. The nurses of the 48th all volunteered for foreign service from those army base hospitals in between August and October 1942, they were sent to New York to form the hospital staff that would then go on to England for more training. Before I get too far into this, I want to uh, give you a visual of some of these women. Um, and these are the women of the 48th, 128th. Um, so as you can see, we have uh, um, three of them in particular, Teresa Archard. She is um, the one in the cap with the emblem on it. In the middle, we have Edna Atkins. And then on the very end uh, is Margaret Hornbeck. Okay. Now these three women are just a couple of the 60 women that were with the hospital, uh, but they have some, some really great um, personal stories as well. Uh, so today we're gonna take um, a little virtual tour here and we are going along with nurses of the 48th, 128th, as they followed 1st Infantry Division during combat. So we're going to pretend we are getting onto a, an airplane. Strap yourselves in. We are flying from Chicago to Algiers at the top of that map there. It's a flight of about 12 hours and 31 minutes. As you can see, when we, we will arrive at the Algiers area, airport, it will be mostly sunny and 67 degrees. Their international terminal was updated in 2019. Now, in the summer of 1942, which was about six months after the bombing of Pearl Harbor, President Roosevelt gave troops a direct order to support the British proposal 
of an, of an attack on French North Africa. Here you can see that map again, very similar to the one I was just showing you. We called it French North Africa because this area was still considered a French colony. And the Germans and Italians had overrun uh, this northern section. Now, four months later, Americans landed in three locations on the coast of North Africa. From November uh, 1942 to May 1943, took the Allies six months to push the Germans and Italian troops out of North Africa. Here, if you can see that map of North Africa, and those of you who might know golf, we've got a dog leg left right here. That was the movement of the 1st Division and our hospital unit, 48th, 128th. We'll call it uh, par six, as it took them six months to get through. And according to globalgolfersmagazine.com, Tunisia, where we ended, is actually North Africa's golf mecca. Now, the 1st Division and the 48th Surgical Hospital arrived on November 8, 1942, in troop transport boats loaded from ocean liners off the coast of Oran, Algeria. This would be the first American amphibious assault in the European Mediterranean theater. This is also the only assault that women would uh, participate in in the fight against the German army and the Axis. Uh, Luth, uh, excuse me, Lieutenant Ruth Haskell describes the water as they were coming in. She describes it as cold and green and churning as it came up over her chest. Two fellow nurses disappeared up to their eyes in the water and soldiers assisted them until they could wade through the surf to the shore. Once on shore, they realized the priority was protective coverage. It was a rundown beach hut and each woman scrambled towards it. Uh, Haskell actually remembered looking back and realizing the puff on the sand behind her was a bullet striking where she had just stood. First night ashore, uh, Lieutenant Haskell and two other nurses, along with three doctors, went with the 1st Infantry Division to their aid station. The aid station overflowed with casualties and they needed help. Casualties means anyone needing medical aid, but most often it refers to the people hurt or killed in battle. At the same time, Lieutenant Margaret Hornbeck, the nurses of a second group, were working to set up in an abandoned French fort. For the next 36 hours, the staff of the 48th Surgical Hospital worked in surgery and triage with almost no supplies, snipers pointing and shooting at the medical buildings, and rats running along the walls in plain sight. After two days of nonstop work, they had cared for 480 casualties. We can see what Oran looked like back in 1942 and what it looks like today. 48th Surgical Hospital was the first and only one of its kind. There were multiple hospitals, different kinds of hospitals, um, but the army had recently reorganized and changed their um, chain of evacuation. So the way they move people from those uh, front lines when injured all the way to safe hospital spaces. The 48th Surgical Hospital was kind of a hybrid of two hospitals. There were 60 um, uh, people, uh, highly trained surgeons and nurses, and they were of course close to the fighting so that they could render, they could give life-saving surgical interventions. Um, most importantly, the entire hospital could be moved by all of the personnel taking care of it um, to remain with the infantrymen during operations. So they picked up and left as quickly as the infantry troops were. Um, um, so from Oran, Algeria, where they first started, the nurses in these two groups that I described kind of leapfrogged each other across the continent just behind the fighting army. Now, we will be traveling as they did in style across Algeria and Tunisia in our two and a half ton truck. Be sure to hold on to your hats. If you were driving right now, you'd be driving on the right side of the road. Highways are relatively well kept and drivers are polite. During the travels in 1942 and 43, the nurses bounced across pitted roads and were guarded by artillery along the way. German pilots loved sunrise and sunset because they can drop right out of the sun and be on top of a convoy before they're sighted, as quoted from Chief Nurse Salter en route to Tunisia. There were few chances for sightseeing when possible, the nurses explored the local area. 
Here you can see we are stopping at the El Cantara Bridge in Constantine, Algeria. When the nurses of the 48th Surgical Hospital visited in 1943, they crisscrossed the bridge exploring both sides of the city. Although the Germans had cleaned out many of the shops during their retreat, there was still much to see. Today, you can do the same, buying uh, particular types of embroidered velvet gowns that you see here. In February 1943, the first and second units, those groups of nurses and doctors from the 48th Surgical Hospital were within 30 miles north and south of the 1st Infantry Division when, these, when the Germans overran Kasserine Pass. With the 48th, Margaret Hornbeck, uh, she remembers, uh, quote, we weren't acquainted with large numbers of casualties. It was in the night when they began to reach us. It was dark. I don't know what time it was. Admitting was full and there was no way to take care of what was there. Hornbeck was not on duty, but others woke her and she went to work quickly in the operating room. She describes, he, the doctor, was going to do decompression. He set up to do brain surgery in the midst of all of that. It was a strange situation to do, be doing brain surgery out in the field. It was nothing short of amazing concept of the American fighting force and we along with them. Um, by February 17th, the Germans came within five miles of the first unit hospital of Margaret's hospital, and they ended up having to retreat. They moved back with the 77th evacuation hospital. They were in charge of 900 patients from Kasserine. Now, throughout the Tun Tun Tunis campaign, <clears throat> they received 90% of the casualties. They were considered the closest hospital to front line. On May 12, 1943, the 48th Surgical Hospital learned the North Africa campaign was officially over. The men and women of the U.S. Army and the Army Nurse Corps had earned their first campaign ribbon. This is a ribbon that they would wear on their uh, uniforms to signify that they made it through this campaign. Now, our last stop on the tour is the final resting place and memorial of almost 5,000 American soldiers. The North Africa, um, African, the North African American Cemetery in Carthage, Tunisia. Just like its European counterparts, this cemetery is part of the American Federal Monuments Commission, so it's laid out and cared for similarly. You will notice that it has crosses, whereas here in the United States, our national cemeteries have um, uh, tombstone-style uh, grave markers. Now, before we go on to Sicily, the army had a little change in plan. Like I said, the 48th Surgical Hospital was going to become an evacuation hospital instead. So they called it the 128th Evacuation Hospital. They realized that the evacuation hospital could be a little further back from the action and still help the soldiers with operations, wound care, and sending them outside of the fighting zones. Uh, it turns out that the hospitals also needed to arrive a little after soldiers since they did not always have the means to fight or even set up their hospital space until the fighting had moved away. In that case, medics and aid stations were the fighting force that with the fighting force helped care for the soldiers until hospitals could be set up. Now, we are going to be going from Algiers to Sicily. We're gonna buckle up on our plane ride this time and we are gonna fly there in an hour and 50 minutes. As you can see, when we arrive at Cephalu, we will have sunny skies and 68 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, on July 10th, 1943, at two in the morning, the initial assault teams from the 1st Infantry Division landed at Jela, Sicily. So here we are having the same fight on another, another island began working their way up the beach. And throughout the day, they achieved success at Jela and two other beaches along Sicily's southern coast and eastern coast. The First Infantry Division was immediately attacked upon their revival. In the following days, it repulsed Italian tank units and went head to head with a very famous uh, German division called the Hermann Goring Division. German panzer tanks in this division made it within range of the command post. But still, with the support of naval guns, uh, offshore, artillery, Sherman tanks, and anti-tank guns, American forces were able to force 
Germans to withdraw from Jela. Now, like I said, the 128th did not arrive initially, um, although uh, they were asked uh, to come with, the commanding officers at the time decided that the hospital could stay back and wait until the initial um, assault had happened. So they arrived uh, from Tunisia and they were set up three weeks after the invasion actually began. On October 2nd, though, there was a heavy storm that struck the hospital and within five minutes, every tent had been torn or leveled. The tent poles, laboratory equipment, x-ray equipment was all broken and there were 195 patients on the ward. So our nurses worked feverently to move ho the hospital into a building in a nearby town. Uh, one of the most significant setbacks during this time uh, that hospital staff nurses had to deal with as long as, as well as the soldiers uh, was virus transmission from host insects in Sicily, outbreaks of sandfly fever and malaria. During the entire campaign, during the entire time that they were on the island, the losses due to this illness alone equated to thousands of soldiers, two whole divisions. And there were actually more people that were sick and had to be removed from fighting than actual battle casualties, those who were injured. However, on August 17th, 1943, uh, the Allied invasion of Sicily ended. So they went from the southern shore to the northern shore of Sicily. As for the 128th, uh, the hospital, they remained in Sicily a little bit longer. Uh, and it was exactly one year after landing in North Africa on November 8th, 1943, the whole evacuation hospital set sail from Sicily, to England, and on to their next phase of living. Now, we're not gonna stop in England. We are gonna go right from Sicily to France. So our plane ride that we're gonna take is going to take us two hours and 55 minutes. Unfortunately, our weather is partly cloudy, about 56 degrees, so still a little warmer than it is here today. On June 6, 1944, if you recognize that date, you will know that that is what we call D-Day. Uh, more than 150,000 Allied soldiers arrived on the coast of France and across 50 miles of beaches, these men advanced and they moved forward into heavy German defenses. These beaches were separated into five sectors. The American troops stormed two sectors, Omaha Beach and Utah. Now, on Omaha Beach, the 1st Infantry Division arrived up to 600 yards from the shore. That's about 24 high school swimming pools or six football fields all put together. With up to 100 pounds on their backs, they swam and waded to shore. As casualties began mounting, injuries were happening, the survivors were trying to help them, pulling them from the shallow water onto the beach. And with no choice, they had to head directly into the machine gun fire. Eventually, one platoon from the 1st Medical Battalion, so the medical group with the division, uh, created a clearing station, an aid station on the high ground above Omaha Beach, and they treated casualties for the next day and a half. By June 7th, surgical teams were able to get supplies and come off the beach to offer more definitive care to the seriously wounded. The first hospital units that set up uh, came ashore. Uh, they came ashore without their nurses. Uh, they came ashore with only their male staff. The first woman from a hospital unit to actually arrive on the beach was Helen Maloney with the 128th. You can see here, there's an image of her setting up a hospital station. Uh, for those first few weeks in France, the 128th Evacuation Hospital was in Boutevilla, about five miles from the coast and five miles from the fighting front. So behind them, they had the sea and in front of them, uh, they had the fighting. Head, neck and face and brain injuries were, the commonly, were most commonly handled at the 128th Evacuation Hospital at this time. In Boutevilla, within about three hours of opening, the hospital had 123 casualties. Uh, 
So you can imagine the injuries that they were facing. Those numbers quickly doubled and in one week, they were already over their 400 bed capacity. Um, eventually more hospital units did arrive and the number of casualties slowed down. Uh, so the nurses and doctors were able to pack up and head out to follow the first infantry division. Now, these hospital nurses and doctors were working most often 12 hour shifts, uh, but times when they had heavy casualties, they would work until, um, until they couldn't, until they, didn't, they weren't needed anymore. So shifts were more uh, fluid and very often women uh, and men were working up to 24 hours at a time. Now from the coast, uh, there was a gentleman with the 1st Infantry Division. He explained it really great. And he compared the troop movement to the German Blitzkrieg. Early on in the war, the Germans had pushed quickly across from Germany through Belgium and into France. And Blitzkrieg is like a lightning war uh, translated. So this gentleman, Alan Town from the 1st Division, he said, now we had the US Army Blitzkrieg and it was almost in the same location. So the 1st Division was moving very quickly across the continent. Trailing them was the 128th Evacuation Hospital. These men and women of the hospital were just northwest of the division in mid-August, so after they arrived on those beaches. And as the division was moving quickly past Paris, the hospital stayed and took casualties from an area called the Filet Pocket. This is kind of an important time because these casualties that they were taking were prisoners of war. And there are rules uh, that were created um, in order to take care of injured individuals and hospital staff. Um, and the Americans uh, in Europe certainly followed these rules. The nurses were required to take care of uh, prisoners of war in the same way that they would take care of uh, an American soldier. They could not deny them care. Uh, they had to take care of them based on their injuries. So if some, if a German was injured um, and needed an immediate surgery, they could not take an American who had a simple cut over that German just because of um, what side they were on. So there were these rules that the nurses had to follow whether or not um, they agreed with them. And so they did, and during this time, took on hundreds and hundreds of German soldiers. Um, and so they cared for them and they quickly were able to transport them to POW camps and other hospitals. And so after clearing out the patients, they headed towards the first division in Dillon, Belgium. Now, much of these women's experience was under tents. Uh, they did not often have hospital buildings. Uh, if they did have buildings, off, uh, many times they had, the buildings had been damaged uh, by other explosion, explosions earlier on. Uh, as you can see, they lived like the soldiers. They didn't necessarily have the facilities to uh, wash and dry their clothes, um, shower, do their hair. Uh, they didn't have these kinds of things the way you might expect today. We can see one of our nurses here is using uh, what looks like a little pot her helmet. The helmet that they wore, they called it steel pot, and you could use it for just about everything. And she is washing her stockings in there. Now, the nurses would wear the fatigues, the uh, olive green uniform that men wore, uh, but they did have for more formal uniforms that were uh, dresses, or I should say a skirt and um, top uh, with stockings and uh, a low heeled shoe. Um, sometimes they did get packages from home and they tried to um, dress like women, dress in uh, fancier clothing, be able to do their hair and even have lipstick. Now, it wasn't until our, our hospital staff, the 128th, got to Belgium, they actually had a solid building to bunk in and work in. And of course, we can also take into consideration the fact that in tents, they didn't have the protection that they did in a building and sometimes uh, they would have to protect their patients as well as themselves from incoming uh, attacks. Uh, every once in a while, uh, soldiers and nurses did get passes to take leave 
for up to 72 hours. So I got a pass to be able to uh, go and explore the areas in Belgium and even sometimes in Paris. You see our soldiers and nurses or young women here are at a dance. Uh, you can see one in pants and another woman with a skirt on. So they did have a little bit of variety in what they got to wear. Unfortunately, we have a, a lovely Lieutenant named Martha Cameron. She was with the 128th and she went to a dance one night. Uh, it was in the winter and she left her quarters. She left her bunk and attended this dance with a young gentleman and they had no idea that the Germans began a massive offensive nicknamed the Battle of the Bulge. So unfortunately, the time they got to the dance and, and got going, 15 minutes after they arrived, date received word the German breakthrough had happened, and they were both forced to return to work. So despite having passes, you didn't always get to stay uh, and enjoy what was around you. Uh, the Battle of the Bulge happened uh, in the wintertime, and by January of 1945, uh, had mostly concluded the allies. So uh, the US, British, French, they had all flattened that bulge in the, um, in the map lines. And they were able to, to stop the Germans from moving any further. The 128th Evacuation Hospital, women and men there were averaging about 300 patients a day. Uh, and they actually were moving into a new town at the same time. Now both, First Infantry Division units and the 128th, they were really settling in to this final push of the war. Although they didn't know it, uh, this would be the last few months that they were going to move forward uh, in World War II. During this time, uh, a colonel with the 128th, Colonel Norman Wiley, recommended Edna Atkins uh, for the Bronze Star Medal. She's the one in the middle of this picture here. Medal citation read, by her constant devotion to duty, her exemplary conduct during enemy shelling and air raids, she contributed materially to her hospital's efficient functioning. She was actually uh, among many women from the unit who earned the Bronze Star Medal throughout their time in North Africa and Europe. By the end of World War II, approximately 1,600 awards and decorations had been given to women. Eventually, we uh, ended the conflict and the European campaign uh, was over. Now, the 1st Infantry Division and the 120th Hospital were about 43 miles from each other. The hospital was in Eastern Germany. And the division had moved all the way across Germany and into Czechoslovakia uh, on VE Day. May 8th, 1945, as everybody was celebrating here in the United States, the newspapers were excited and sharing the news. It was more of a muted joy uh, that our soldiers and nurses had um, during this time. They had essential jobs um, in, in the 1st Infantry Division, gentleman named Alan Town, the one that I mentioned earlier, was a medic. These nurses and hospital staff, they were crucial um, to war efforts. Now their concern was that they would be sent to the Pacific Theater. Although the Germans had surrendered, uh, this was in May, uh, the Japanese fought on. And they did not surrender un until later on in the year. Uh, so nurses and the soldiers were concerned the need for manpower would fall onto them since their war was over onto the divisions that were leaving the European theater of operation. Uh, so at this point, uh, they, they were a little concerned, but the military had what was called a point system. And the more time that they spent in the conflict, the more points they had. Uh, and the nurses, the 60 nurses that were with the 48th, 128th, uh, had now gotten to about 17 of the original uh, individuals. And a number of the 1st Infantry Division soldiers had also been with the original units to arrive in North Africa. So this means that their points had accumulated for almost three years. 
Uh, so these individuals were up high on the list to be able to go home and not have to go to the Pacific Theater. Uh, so between July and December of 1945, all of our soldiers from, from the 1st Infantry Division and all of the members of the 128th Evacuation Hospital got to go home to the United States. So, you know, these women, these uh, nurses, you know, they persevered through 3,000 miles in North Africa and Europe during the war. They lived with bugs, and sickness, undernourishment, and extreme temperatures, just like the soldiers. They advanced and retreated. They suffered casualties. Um, they feared buzz bombs. Now, is this really revolutionary? Not exactly. Women have been doing that aid unpaid since the beginning of, of uh, time. Uh, however, they are part of a group, they are a group of individuals whose story hadn't been told in the past. Marginalized individuals oftentimes were ignored in that bigger story. So these women of the 128th, uh, the 48th, 128th, um, really add a rich sense to what we know of uh, as a conflict World War II. So I appreciate everybody listening to the story of the women of uh, this particular hospital unit. Great, Jessica, that was great. Um, so we have a couple of questions for you. Uh, one is from uh, Ms. Janet. And she asks, uh, didn't making the nurses officers have a rationale in case they were captured by the enemy? So, uh, so she's asking about what happens if nurses were captured by the enemy and if that had anything to do with um, nurses being limited in rank. Um, there, there is some rationale there. Um, the, the nurses, there were a couple reasons for it, uh, and, and that was certainly helpful. There were different uh, prisoner of war camps based on whether you're an officer or an enlisted person, um, as well as uh, the, the type of job that you had. Um, in, in Europe, it was not uh, as much of a concern. Um, now, the, the Geneva Convention states that medical personnel had to be um, given certain, um, certain accom uh, accommodations if they were a prisoner of war. So they they were not um, they were not killed on site. They didn't carry or they didn't carry weapons. So they were not um, killed on site. They were given um, the ability to treat other prisoners of war. I am not as well versed in the Pacific. However, I do know that the the Geneva Convention was not followed, and there were nurses, women who were um, killed as prisoners of war uh, by the Japanese. Did the nurses receive benefits or recognition as veterans after the war? No, um, they, I, I can't say no entirely. Um, they, they did eventually, um, but it was not immediately. So uh, three of the women, I can tell you, three of the, the women that I showed you images of, they went home and continued their nursing careers. Uh, one in Kentucky, one in Green Bay, another one in Indiana. So they were all over the country. And um, very often, they didn't tell anybody of their experience either. Um, in researching the individuals, I have found obituaries where it was not even mentioned that they were in World War II, that they did anything. It was what they did with their family, their church and their home life. So um, very often these women did not tell anyone. However, um, Edna Atkins, she went back to Green Bay and uh, she was a nurse for the rest of her life. And she helped found an American Legion post up there that, was, that is all women. So I think it's post 539 in Green Bay is an all women's American Legion post and it is named after another woman. And um, so it's a really great experience, um, a great legacy for those ladies um, to have uh, put together since it wasn't very common uh, that they even 
told anybody or tried to uh, support themselves with any military benefits. So uh, Jessica, did, did women have any other roles um, in Europe or, or, or with the American military other than being nurses? Many, 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 many roles. Um, the, Amer the Army Nurse Corps was just, is just one group um, during World War II. There, uh, there were women uh, with the Air Force, with the Army, um, and with the Navy uh, that were auxiliary. Um, so you hear the term whack or wave. Um, and these were women who also volunteered. Most of the positions that they held when they were overseas were uh, clerical positions. Um, very often they worked stateside and there were women who were instructors for fighter pilots. There were women who flew airplanes um, back and forth across the country. Uh, so lots of different positions. The Marine Corps was the only um, military uh, unit, military group that actually had women join them entirely. So the Army Nurse Corps was its own entity from the Army, uh, whereas women who joined the Marine Corps joined the Marine Corps. And they did service jobs, very similar, very clerical, um, but they were actual members of the Marine Corps. Wow, that, I actually didn't know that. I, I didn't know that they were, that they were full members. Mm -hmm. um, well, so uh, Jessica, tell us more about, um, you know, how close the hospital really came to the front lines and especially during something mm -hmm. like the Battle of the Bulge where it was a surprise attack and, and you know, how was it defended? How was it, uh, you know, how, how did the, the women who worked there handle that kind of sudden stress? Sure. Uh, you, know, you, you said that one of them was out at a party and, and, and had to go back. So how do you, you know, how do they handle that sort of stress? Um, believe it or not, most of the women, uh, so when they were under attack, let's put it this way, when they were under attack, um, they were uh, thinking of their patients first. Uh, they had the steel pot helmet, right? They had their protection, um, but in most cases, they threw themselves onto their patients. They pulled their patients underneath the cots. They were um, first and foremost thinking of the patients. Um, there are stories of losing power and in, um, uh, in the midst of surgery, um, moving patients to the floor to complete surgeries. Um, so the, the stress is real and I don't have any solid information about PTSD or the effects of those, the stress on those women, but they absolutely had patients in mind first. Uh, they certainly didn't have um, much experience with defending the hospital, uh, but the hospitals were not uh, standalone necessarily away from um, other troops. So the areas themselves would have been um, pretty well defended. There have been mistakes. Hospitals are set up right next to ammunition dumps. And so, you know, the rules say don't bomb a hospital, but the ammunition's right next to it. You know, they, there were accidents that did happen, unfortunately. Um, during the Battle of the Bulge, there was one hospital that was rescued by um, members of the 1st Infantry Division that had to be moved out of um, the, the move, the, from behind the German lines. Uh, but most often, these women in particular would have been about 30 miles away from the front lines. So uh, Jessica, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, and I know that our audience has enjoyed it. Um, if you haven't visited the First Division Museum, can you tell us a little bit about uh, the First Division Museum and, and a little about what you, what you do there? Absolutely, so I am the museum specialist at uh, the First Division Museum at Cantini Park in Wheaton, Illinois. Uh, Wheaton is eh, 45 miles or so outside of the city. And um, we have a 500 acre park, uh, which uh, has two museums and um, a tank park on it. It's, it's just a really fun place uh, for you to go. Currently, uh, we are renovating the House Museum and we have our military museum, the First Division Museum open. I am lucky enough, I get to uh, help research and actually tell the stories through the exhibits that we put up. 
Uh, so if you come through, you will learn all about the 1st Infantry Division in World War I up through the present um, in, the, in our galleries through dioramas and um, artifacts that we have and some great tech um, to really listen to the soldiers tell their own stories. Right. The exhibits down at the 1st Division Museum are fantastic. Uh, I, I was there just a few months ago and I will be back again next month uh, for, for a different program and, and they are just fantastic. So with that, thank you for joining and you all have a great day.